Last week we began a new series of messages called This Is Us. Now, some of you are big fans of the show, and I, Rhonda and I watch faithfully. And unlike the TV show, and we're going to share the teaching part of this with the several members of our staff in the course of the series. Unlike the TV show, our goal in the series is not just to make you cry every episode all the way through. Uh, but like the TV show, we do acknowledge that we live in a complicated world, and it's a messy world, and it's a world filled with challenges. And there's some things that make us different than the rest of the world. There is a this is us element that's significant in the scriptures, makes us who belong to God, who live in relationship to him, different than the rest of the world. See, we live in the same broken world with everyone else, and we're going to get caught up in the wake of some of that. We're going to feel the brokenness of the world. But here's what makes us us as followers of Jesus Christ. This is the this is us part of the story. And, and that part of the story is that we're going through this broken world in a relationship to God who created this world. And the Bible says he holds it all together. And he's given us hope beyond this world and hope in this world through the victory that is ours, through Jesus Christ. And that just makes us a whole lot different than a lot of uh, people. It makes us different than them. And the Bible declares that reality of there's an us and there's a them factor to, to the population of the world. Uh, it makes it clear. Here's some passages just to illustrate that. First one from 1 Peter. They, talking about the people who them, they stumble because they do not obey God's word. So they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that. This is us. For you are a chosen people, your royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. There's us and there's them. Be blameless, Paul wrote to the Philippians. Be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish. In the midst of, because this is the world you live in, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among them, you shine as lights in the world. In a world that's so dark, you shine as lights. There's a us, there's a them. Do not love this world, First John. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever, us and them. And so you see the pattern. There's a this is us theme that runs throughout the Bible. And it is a tremendous clarifier in relationship to our world, that there, there are people who love God and there are people who don't. There are people who are going to follow Jesus and there are people who won't. There, there are people who are going to lean into relationship to God and people who, who do not. There, there are people who obey, people who don't. And today, as we talk about this is us, we're going to focus on one of these clarifying passages about being different than the rest of the world, being set apart and finding great joy, fulfillment, and purpose in that. So we're going to look at Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. There are 150 psalms. We're looking at the first one today, and it is, uh, it's a great way to start uh, in the psalms because it tells a great story, blessed. Boy, don't you look for more than hashtag blessed? Don't you look for sustained blessed? Don't you look for a well, life blessed? And not just things are going the way I want them to. Blessed by God, by the hand of God upon you. And here's what it says, chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They're like the chaff the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's a them and there's an us. They're the people who belong to God, walk in relationship to God, and the people who do not. Now, 
I want to jump in with a story. The story comes from the Los Angeles Times. A few years ago, John Ortberg told this story, referred to the article, and as I picked it up from him. So there was a guy, and he grew up in a neighborhood, Los Angeles area. And in that neighborhood, he grew up. When he got to young adulthood, he took off, went to see the world. Anyway, he stayed in touch with mom uh, back home. But he'd been away for 20 years. He hadn't been back to the old house, the old neighborhood in 20 years. Through a series of circumstances, he went back home. The old neighborhood, the old house. And he went into the house and so many things. You know, the, the, the sights, the smells just reminded him of everything, of home, everything that had been. He found a lot of joy in that. He, he went to his old room. Mom hadn't changed much in there. He, he remembered a lot of keepsakes are stored up in the attic. Mom said she hadn't touched anything. He went up there. He started poking around. and anyway, One of the things he found up in the attic was, was this jacket. that Boy, he loved that, that jacket. And in 20 years, you never know how a jacket's going to fit. Not many of my jackets from 20 years ago still fit right. But he, he found his jacket. Slid it on, still good. He said, man, I love this jacket. I, I'd forgotten it was even here. He stuck his hands in his pockets, and that's when he felt something in one of the pockets. He pulled it out. Well, it was a, it was a ticket. It was a claim ticket, because he he'd forgotten all about it. He'd taken in a pair of shoes to be repaired at a local shoe repair shop sometime 20 years earlier, and... Uh, He'd forgotten all about his shoes. Well, 20 years. But he's exploring the old neighborhood. And so as the story in the Times went, he, he's going through the neighborhood, and he's wearing his jacket. And lo and behold, that old shoe shop is still there, shoe repair. He thought, what are the odds? So he walked in. It's the same guy. He's been... He, 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 He'd been working since he was young. Now he's closing on retirement, you know, but he's, he's at the shoe repair shop, same guy at the counter. And so he walks in, says, hey, I have this claim ticket um, to see if my shoes were still here. The guy took it, and he looked at the number. He turns, he goes back to the work area. A little bit, he came back out, and he said, we've been really busy. They'll be ready Friday. <laughs> now, That story has nothing to do with the sermon at all, but I really enjoy the story, so some things are just for me. Now, now actually, we're talking about a sense of urgency when we tell a story like that. There's a whole lot of people in our world, there's just not much sense of urgency that we need to move the ball down the field. Something needs to happen, and, and we need a sense of urgency about our faith, too. Uh, sometimes we think we have forever to get it right, forever to, to make a move, forever to be true and obedient and there's so many things we can focus on in life and certainly in faith uh, I was reading a blog article I was preparing this, most of the sermon preparing in November and there was a blog article I came across and I do a lot of blog reading and I, I find things that are interesting to me and there's a my blog I have a blog but I post articles that eh, may be interesting to you things about parenting things about marriage things about Christian life and so I read this article, and it's by a pastor, and I know nothing about him, nothing about his church, and I, he may be a swell guy, but in his article, what he was, he's kind of bragging about, he said, I've been preaching a series of sermons through the book of Romans for four years, and I'm not even close to being finished. Well, now, I love Romans as much as anybody. I think it's a high water mark in the New Testament. But that's a guy leading a church that has no sense of urgency about the gospel. Man, you, you need to move faster than that with, with something missional, something that's going to make a difference in eternity than, than that. Here's what I found, though. Urgency is not our default mode. Complacency is how we're wired. To just think we have forever to get anything right, to, to lean into what's really important, that there's always next year or next month or some other time that we can get this right. We live in a time when we cannot settle for business as usual. We say, hey, you know, what does normal Christian life look like? Well, normal, 
normal <laughs> is not just sitting on our hands. Normal, normal doesn't describe the radiant bride of Christ, his church. Normal does not describe Jesus who laid down his life for our sins. Normal does not describe anything of the early church in the book of Acts. Normal, normal isn't beating back the gates of hell. We are called by God to build this community of faith, to be a community of faith that, that really loves Jesus and really loves the church in the, and, and loves the mission that God has given the church. Back in the fall, we, we spent a whole Sunday talking about this, and you see it. We, we'll, we'll talk more in detail about the symbol of it, but we have a, a different church logo, different name for our church. Periodically over time, we've changed just to... Freshen things up. Here's one of the things that we said. We spent a whole Sunday talking about this on our anniversary Sunday back in October. And we said, we are First Baptist Church, FBC, Allen, Texas. We've been here a very long time. A very long time. Uh, and, this is our 139th year. We, at this, pretty much at this spot. And first means we're the first people to put up a sign that said we're Baptists in town. And Baptist means we're not Lutheran or Methodist or Catholic or something else. We're Baptist. And then church, which means we're not a, a civic organization, a social organization. We're not a, a business. We're a church. So First Baptist Church. And that's helpful in some ways. But when you talk to your friends, your family, your neighbors, and you say, they say, so where do you go to church? And you say, First Baptist Church. That's really not that helpful. Well, so... The this is us side of it. So who are you? Well, FBC. And this is how we want to, maybe just to help you think about who, what, what a church is and who we are. F stands for faith in Christ. We're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna, we want to be a people who are walking in, in a vital relationship to God through his son Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ. B stands for belong in community. That we believe you're going to grow best in doing the one another's in community. So everybody needs to be in Christian community. You need to be in a group. And so belong in community. And the third thing is we are commissioned by God, called out by God to be on mission, telling the good news of Jesus everywhere, all the time, wherever we are, whatever we're doing. And that's what it means to be FBC Allen. And that's, what, that's the people we want to be. And that is a tall order. So how do you do that day to day? I mean, how do we do it as a Community of believers, how do we do it individually day to day? And it's tough because, because there's so many other things that are screaming for our attention, that are demanding our commitments. And it seems like, it seems like as a people of faith, we're, well, you know, you, you, you can take it or leave it. You can, you can do it for a while. You can drop it like a hot rock. You, can, you, you, you come and you go and urgency, a loss to us sometimes. How do we maintain a clear focus on the things that matter to God and matter to the people who claim to belong to God? We're talking about disciples, followers, believers, the church. Well, that's what we want to talk about. Now, first word of the first verse of the first psalm, blessed. And it's a big word. It's a big word. It doesn't count. It, 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 there's a lot of explanation that comes with the word like blessed. Some of your translations might say happy, but it's about bigger than happy. One of the interesting things about this particular word, in Hebrew, it's plural. It's not singular. It's plural. Uh, think about it this way. Oh, the blessednesses. Oh, the happinesses of. Showers of blessing. Uh, God, God does not does not offer up his blessing in carefully measured rations. He, he pours it out in abundance. Oh, the blessedness, in plural, oh, the blessednesses of God's blessing. Now, verse 1. Uh, in this blessed, happy, and if it's plural, we'll say happy, happy, happy. When someone comes into right relationship to God, Here's the deal. And this is the part we, we, we kind of run from sometimes because we think, man, it's all, about, it's all about grace and we don't need a lot of rules and a lot of thou shalt nots. And we start bogging down in that stuff. And yet, there's a lot of value to be found in those things. And that's why they show up in Scripture prominently. And so in verse 1, here's what we're going to find. 
there's certain things that when you belong to Jesus, there's certain things you just don't do. And there's certain places you don't go. And there's certain people you don't spend time with. There, there's a clear, this is us and this is them that is going to be significant. And now, here's where God's Word spells out a plan for living in relationship to God. And a whole lot of this has to do with this little piece of the puzzle. It happens in relationship to other people. And the people that you spend time with in relationship are going to have a significant bearing on on what happens with your life and how life goes for you. Now, here's where it gets complicated. I don't control all the people that I'm going to interact with. We have these circles of influence, and you have people at work, and you have neighbors, and you, you, you're going to interact with a lot of people who are far from God, and you're supposed to. Don't you wall yourself up away from a lost world. You need to actively engage with that lost world. People need to know Jesus, and the only way they can get to know Jesus is they get to know people who know Jesus. So we're going to reach out and we're going to engage. And our church is leaning into that in a great way in the season of our church life. But are you plant, is your life planted with people far from God? And that's where it can start to scramble your spiritual life. With spiritually lost people in our circles of influence, we're going to reach out to them. But where are you planted? Where are you really fully engaged? So there's this biblical principle about the dangers of temptation to sin based upon the people you spend time with. Moses, he talked about it, and he talked about it, and he talked about it before the Israelites entered into the promised land. And he said, you're coming in here, and these guys are a bunch of pagans, and you're going to be doing business with them, and you're going to work with them, you're going to be around them, they're going to be your neighbors. But they can't be your core relationships. They can't be your business partners. They, they can't be the, the people that you're spending the bulk of your time with in, in relationship. Because you want, in the Old Testament, where in the New Testament, it's, it's, it's going out. In the Old Testament, the idea was that the people of God would be so holy, so pure, so God-honoring that they would draw in the pagan peoples. They would see there's such a difference in their lives. And he said, but when you start spending time with those people, there's a better than zero chance they're going to pull you away from God a long time before you pull them toward God. So you're going to have to measure what those relationships look like. Where are you planted? There are verses like this. I remember in student ministry when I was in middle school and high school, we talked a lot about do not be deceived. Bad company ruins, corrupts good morals. The people you spend time with, they're either going to move you closer to God or they're going to pull you away from God. So where are you investing in your relationships? And here's what it looks like. And he does it in layers in verse 1. And in, that ver in those verses, there are nouns and there are verbs. We're going to look at the... At the verbs first in verse 1. Here's the first one. Walk. And it suggests a casual relationship. Man, you encounter people. And you go a distance with them. You have things in common. You have things you do together. You walk with them. Then there's stand. Stand talks about uh, a little closer relationship. You're pulling, you're pulling up range. You're, you're spending time together. And then there's the sit. And when you sit with someone, you're really... You're, your, your complete absorption into their activities. You are partnered in, in relationship. Now there's some nouns. They show the same kind of downward pull of sin, a regression of moral standing, a regression of moral character. Talks about wicked, ungodly, some of your translations say. And that's a person that they're just going to make choices that are outside of God's will. They're going to make choices. They're going to disobey, dishonor the Lord. But then there are sinners and that describes people that uh, they're having to put on a name tag now to say, I, I am a sinner because it is the pattern of my life. And if you're, you're spending time, significant time, with those who would be described more as sinners, it's the pattern of their life. There's a greater danger, and it leads to scoffers. And scoffers are the people that they become so hardened to the things of God, so arrogant about spiritual things that they just... I don't care what God says. I don't care what God thinks. I don't care what his word declares. I don't care what his people believe. I'm going to do what I want to do, and that ought to be just fine. And that's the, the depths of falling away from God, to be scoffers. And if you're spending time with scoffers, it's going to wear on you. So you see how it works. And 
you may have found yourself caught up in this pattern where you realize, you, you read something like that and you say, well, I, I see where I'm planning my life and I'm, and I'm a little more in category two than I think I should be. Maybe there are times where I've drifted into category three and I'm, I'm just cantankerous toward the things of God. Uh, but where, where are you planted and with whom are you planted in your life? And what happens is you just wake up one day. I, I've been in ministry long enough. I've seen a lot of people who've, who've made this progression or regression. And you just wake up one day and you find yourself in a place spiritually you never intended to be in. Because people drift and fall and evolve away from God. Here's how it works. If you're not careful, if you're not guarded, if you're not focused in your life, here's what happens. You, you develop a casual relationship with someone, and you have something in common. There's something that you shared, and it's fun to be with them to share whatever that is. And, but the thing is, they don't share your values. They don't share a relationship to God. They're not interested in that part. In fact, that's not even a part of anything that you're sharing back with them, but you have a common interest. And they're not terrible people. But occasionally, uh, they're going to be out of step with right living as God defines it. Just compromised. But just a little bit compromised. And what could that hurt? But then we shift our views of holiness. Because we don't want to come off like a prude. Like we're just all stuffy. There's a fear of missing out. I don't want to be on the outside. I want to be in with the in group. We talk about peer pressure with uh, kids. But man, peer pressure doesn't change when you're in your 80s. People lean into the people around them, don't like to stand out, stand apart. And we begin to join in with the unbelieving friend, not just in that something that we share in common, but in a whole lot of stuff, including our worldview and what's important and what's not. And it begins with one step, and it moves to this pattern of behavior. And finally, you just end up in the seat of scoffers and you're hard to the things of God and you're comfortable with sin and you're comfortable with sinners. So when we talk about relationship to Jesus, this is us. There's some things in a relationship to God that, that requires, calls, reflects God. And I know that we... We have this inclination as a people to compartmentalize our lives. Where we say, well, it's Sunday and I'm here. Tomorrow, I'm going to be a long way from anything here. Uh, I'm going to compartmentalize my life. Now, I'm, I'm changing hats. I'm, I'm going to take off my Jesus hat that I put on for a couple hours on Sunday morning. I'm going to put on my, my other hat and that's okay. I'm going to rationalize what I'm doing or not doing because... It fits my context of relationship. Compartmentalize my faith so that it's nice and contained. And we claim relationship and commitment to Jesus the Christ. But truthfully, our lives, they're not planted with Jesus. But they're planted with the wicked, with the sinners, with the scoffers. That's where we're really dug in. And you're not really relating to them with the gospel and they're not changing, but they are doing a whole lot of changing in you. And this, this truth runs through all of Scripture. The psalmist warns us, be careful. Because the blessed life, there are things that you don't do when you're going to live the blessed life. You say, oh God, please bless me. Bless my kids. Bless my marriage. Bless my work. But you have to position yourself, plant yourself in a spot where you're blessable. Because God is under no obligation to bless anybody's sin. And he's not going to bless a life that is far from him. Now, how do you avoid that path? That, that regression from walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers. Well, this is one of those times when verse 1 kind of wear you out. Verse 2 gives you some hope. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. And the word of God is our hope in this. Now we're going to spend a whole Sunday here shortly on the word of God. Because this is us. That's a big part of who we are as a church. But this is not some kind of dull responsibility. Like, well, I brushed my teeth. I took the trash out on trash day. And I, oh, and I spent some time in God's word. 
That's not how it's described. His delight is in the law of the Lord. It, it overflows with great joy, this law of the Lord. It's not, it's not something that's a religious activity. It's a relationship with God. And that's the reality of, of this life. And when you, when you spend time in God's word, you're going to have a different counselor for your life than the ungodly man. And you're going to have different company you're spending time with than the sinful man. And you're going to have a different cause for life than the scornful man. What do you do with the law? Well, the way the psalmist says it is you meditate on it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the essence of what it means to have a relationship to God, (laughs) it's the ability to hear God's voice and know what he's saying and then to do it, to apply it to your life, to make it your reality. And when you don't, When you only experience to God occasionally, which is what the world tells you is all good, compartmentalize your life, just, just spread it out. Here's my God hat, here's my, here's my work hat, here's my social hat. The word, the world has ta- taught us, think about, think about life with God, and that's really important. That's a swell thing. Think about it as background music to your life story. Think about it like uh, God is, you Photoshop God into your family picture. Oh, yeah, here's our family. Here's me and my life. And I'm doing whatever I want to. But, I'm, oh, oh, and God's a part of that. And I'm going to Photoshop him into my picture. And that's just a different story than what the Bible talks about. That will fog your reasoning, weaken your will, and numb your conscience. And, and it fills your, your mind and your, your life with all these things that are going to put you in conflict with what God says. With the life that's blessable. Paul said to the church at Rome, and I'll do this from the New Living Translation. Just You'll hear it differently maybe than you've thought of it before. Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. Now, meditation. Because it's a popular word, and it means different things depending on the context. Uh, there is Eastern meditation, and that is not what this is talking about. Eastern meditation is based on the idea, empty your mind, clear your mind of all things. And whatever pops in next is some great truth. Well, Satan's always looking for a dumb, empty mind. And he is more than glad to pop into your reality and turn you every which way but loose. That is not what this is talking about. Biblical meditation is completely different than that. Biblical meditation is based on filling your mind, but not with any imaginable crazy. It's filling your mind with the Word of God. You meditate upon the Word of God. You make it your priority. You fill... It's, it's, it's focusing on God in such a way that it frees you from a sinful world and frees you to a more fully attach yourself to God. It's a spiritual focus. What does God say in his word? Not how you feel. Not what the culture says. Not the opinions of your opinion or other people's opinions. It's what God says in his word, which is authoritative. It is trustworthy, inerrant, infallible. You use whatever big sweeping word you want to use to describe the power of the word of God. Now I want to tell you another story. I read this uh, years ago. It was this guy was told his story. He was a guy, he's a farmer in Kansas. And he raised two sons on the farm. And both sons, when they graduated from high school, they both joined the Navy and uh, became career guys in the Navy. Now, the father, he stayed on the farm. And he, uh, he always wondered about that. He had a brother who was a psychologist and his brother, the psychologist, had come to come out to the farm to visit. And, uh, the dad said, now you're a psychologist. Why don't you tell me this? How is it a couple of boys that grew up on a farm in Kansas with no bodies of water around or boats on any bodies of water, how do they both end up going to the Navy? Well, the brother, he was staying in the boys' old room. That was functions as the guest room at that point. A couple of little twin beds in there. So... This is what, uh, how, how the story unfolds. 
So brother said, well, I'll think on that. There's no telling. Seems kind of odd to me too. And he walked in the boy's room and as he walked in the door, there's a picture on the wall here. Beds were against the wall where the door was. He, uh, he walked and spent the night there. He came down the next day and he said, I'll tell you exactly why both your boys joined the Navy. He said, okay, How, what, what's the answer? And he said, well, I'm, first of all, I'm just smarter than you are as your brother. I'm just going to brotherly love. And then he said, why don't you go up to the room with me? So they walked up to the room. Now, when you walk through the door, there's a big wall. There wasn't a whole lot on the wall. They're pretty simple farming folk. But there's a, there was a painting, simple painting, not, not expensive. I don't know where they, even, you know, he didn't mention where they found it. But there's nothing of great value about it, except it's a picture of the ocean and a ship on the ocean. He said, I want you to lay down the boy's bed. He laid down one of the twin beds. He said, now, now, now get up. Okay. Here's the story. How long, is that, how long has that, that picture been on that wall? He said, what you put up there? The boys were about three years old when they finally, you know, they had their own room and uh, big boy beds. He said, you know, if, if every time you walk into that room, what you see is you see the ocean and that, and that ship. And if the last thing you see when you go to bed at night is the ocean and that ship, and the first thing you see in the morning when you get up is the ocean and that ship, there's a pretty good chance you're going to raise you a couple of sailors. If, if the Word of God saturates your life, there's a pretty good chance you might end up a saint one day. You might really reflect all the things God wants your life to reflect. Now, meditating on God's Word is taking the time to hear God's Word and apply God's Word. See, it's not just reading through it. Uh, we're challenging it. We challenge it every year. Read your Bible every day at whatever level. Now, I'll consume a lot of Bible at this point in my life, and I think it's really important for me to, to, do, to do that, and I'll go deep on certain things during the course of the year. And so I... I cracked open my new Bible and I brought a brand new Bible, a new translation. I've never read through the whole Bible. I read the New Testament in this translation, never the whole Bible. I'm pretty excited about it. So I'm, I'm tearing through uh, a new translation, new Bible. But see, the goal of engaging with the Bible every day, the goal of reading your Bible every day is not to get through the Bible like, hey, accomplished it, read the whole Bible this year, read the whole New Testament this year. The goal is for the Bible to get through me. That's why you read the Bible. And you want to apply it to your life. And we've been talking about this. How do you apply it to your life? It's always ask good questions. And write stuff down. So as you read, you take a Bible story. You take, here's, this is six chapters in the first Psalm. You take something like that and just ask some questions. What is this chapter, Psalm 1? What does it say about God? What does it teach me about God? You mean to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What, is it, what about his character, about his ways, about how he does things? What does it say about God? What does it say about people? Well, there's a lot it says about people. So what does it say about God? What does it say about people? And then I say, is there a sin in there somewhere that I ought to avoid? Yeah, there's some sin mentioned. Is there a promise that maybe is something God's saying for me? Yeah, maybe there's a promise. Is there an example to follow? Well, I look at that thing and say, yeah, there's lots of example to follow. A good, bad, and other. Is there a command to obey? Yeah, I got a little bit of that going there too. And you can take any passage, any Bible story, and just ask those basic questions. You're going to find a lot of room for application. This is what God has to say to me today, and here's what I'm going to do about what He has said to me today. We live in this spiritually dry world. Uh, anybody want to give a testimony to that? It sucks the spiritual life right out of you. It will beat it out of you. And as you encounter this world that is not focused on God, you're going to feel the the drought of spiritual things. And in fact, even when you're serving God, when I am in the middle of doing exactly what God has told me to do, full out obedience to God in ministry and service, it's going to wear me out because spiritual resources have to be renewed. You know, you remember the story, Jesus, lady touches the hem of his garment. He says, I felt power go out from me. Jesus had to replenish his power. You got to replenish yours. So whether it is because she's living in a sinful environment, whether sin's going to deplete spiritual power, ministry and obedience is going to deplete spiritual power. So, in a spiritually 
In a spiritual desert, you, you need to be firmly planted by streams of water. In meditating on God's Word, spending time engaged fully in God's Word, is like just knowing, not that I'm going to try to get a little moisture here, or a little moisture there, but that I'm planted by a stream of water, the Word of God. And I don't have to worry about drought, and I don't have to worry about, about where the next drink's coming from. Because my life is planted in the right place. One of the things I love about this passage, the word planted, planted by streams of water. Planted, sometimes the same word can be translated transplanted. The idea is there's a plan. There's a gardener. There's a design. It's not by accident. It's not random. But God has planted them there. They have chosen to be planted there and to stay there. And the one who is planted by a stream of water will never lack what it needs. Now, there's an outline in your program. This thus concludes the introduction to the sermon. Now we're going to start the sermon. Three things. These are things that characterize the man, the woman who chooses what is right and protects their heart for the things of God. That they say, I'm going to plant my life by this stream of water, the Word of God. I'm going to make some choices. There's some things I'm not going to do and some people I'm not going to do it with. But I'm also going to make some choices about where I'm going to plant and where I'm going to invest. And that's what it means to live in right relationship to God and right relationship to others, which is the core of what it means to be a believer, be a Christ follower, be a disciple. And what it means to be righteous, righteousness, right relationship to God, the vertical, right relationship to others, the horizontal. And the righteous person is happy, blessed, joyous, regardless of the circumstances. They are fulfilled when everyone else is on a desperate search, trying to find something that will satisfy, something that lasts, and they're looking in all the wrong places. One of the keys to the Christian life, and a lot of people miss this, I want to be happy, I want to be joyful, I want to be satisfied, I want to be fulfilled. Holiness and happiness go hand in hand. You live the life of holiness the way God's designed it to be lived, the way He's called us to live it, you're going to find happiness. Even when the world around you is a storm, you find, you find the reserves and you find the strength and you find the focus to experience the joy, the happiness, the blessedness that God intends for your life, and it can't be taken away. Second thing, the righteous person is fruitful. Do you know over 50 times in the New Testament, we are told that when you belong to God, when you have a relationship to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, you're going to be fruitful. There's spiritual fruit produced in your life. It's going to overflow outside of you. Here are a couple of verses. Paul talked about it. He said, I want to work, he's talking to the Romans. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I've seen among other Gentiles. That there are things, and by the way, he wants to see it because it's visible. It's not just, oh yeah, deep, 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 deep down in my heart, there's something that's good. Now it overflows. It's visible, measurable, transferable. Here's, uh, here's another verse. This is uh, from Jesus. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Now this is a big one. On that fruitfulness, whether it's the fruit of the Spirit, or it's the fruit of the Gospel, but there is spiritual fruit that happens when you belong to God. And it's and it's evidence you belong to God. Because if there's no spiritual fruit that's measurable, discernible, that, you, that, that, that somebody can point to and say, there I can see fruitfulness. What that, what that verse says, what Jesus said is, this, this just shows even if you belong to Him. Because no spiritual fruit, no things overflowing beyond you, uh, you need to go back and look at that relationship again. And then, the secret to fruitfulness Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide, remain, sometimes it's translated. The psalmist said, planted. Where are you dropping your life down in relationship to God? Where are you really digging in to say, this is where my life will be planted? When you're deeply rooted in God's Word, planted by this stream 
of his daily presence. You, you can't help but produce spiritual fruit in all sorts of ways. And ultimately, that fruit is just the character of Christ being on display in your life. Here's the third thing. The righteous person is permanent. The righteous person has eternal life. And that is not true. Uh, eternal life with God, not true with the ungodly, the wicked, the sinners. They chose I am not going to abide, not going to remain, not going to plant my life with God. And as a result, in this life and in the life to come, they're going to find themselves separated from God. In, in the life to come for all eternity. God created you for a relationship to Him. He's reaching out to you. He sent Jesus to pay for your sin at the cross. He offers up to you heaven one of these days and all that possible. Do a choice. Here's the issue. Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you say yes to Jesus? I'm going to plant my life with him. That's where I'm going to invest. That's where I'm laying it all down. Uh, for some of you today, you, you look at this, and, and I hope you look at it hard. There have been seasons in my life where I can say, you know, I think I'm, I'm walking a little more in the path of sinners than I, than I ought to. Things are out of out of uh, out of line here and I need to change some things I need to adjust the course of my life not that I, I, I'm, I'm trying to expand the number of lost people I'm interacting with but I'm not planning my life with them and that's the day where the danger comes in you're planning your life with people far from God and this is this is not good intentions this is not oh give the good Sunday school answer that whatever the question is just say Jesus this is about, this is about where is your life really planted. And my challenge to you, 2018, plant your life, dig in deep with Jesus and be blessed.